think we left off on Wednesday with, we hadn't yet quite finished Robert Hayden's Those Winter Sundays. <clears throat> I think we had about the last, last stanza to do. <clears throat> Let me read the whole thing again. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black coal. Then with cracked hands and ache from labor in the weekday weather, made bank fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call. And slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Okay, so we talked about the images in the first two stanzas. And slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, tells us what's meant by chronic angers of that house. Or what does that imply? Houses can't be angry, right? I mean, you could say that's personification, that the house is somehow angry. It's the people in the house. This is a family that possibly doesn't get along or that there's a lot of arguing Speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold, who or what is doing the speaking indifferently? Is that the chronic angers of the house? Or is that the I? And what's meant by indifferently? What are you if you are indifferent? How do you express indifference? I don't care. That's how. Whatever. Do what you want to do. Doesn't matter to me. All those phrases reflect indifference. Speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. See, I think the I think that all of those three lines can refer back to the speaker, the I, okay? Or it could be the chronic angers of the house that are doing that. But it's more than likely the I because there's an emphasis, there's a movement, a shift in those lines in the final stanza to the idea of the indifference towards one who had done what? Who had, one, driven out the cold, warmed up the house, and polished my good shoes. How did the father polish the speaker's good shoes? Literally, what does that involve? What, what would the father have to have used? Hands. And yet we're told what about the father's hands? That ache from labor in the weekday weather. Okay? The implication is this guy's hands are sore on Sundays. And what does he do? Before anybody else, he gets up, he starts the fire, and he even polishes this speaker's shoes with hands that are sore, even though this speaker doesn't apparently give dad the time of day. What did I know, comma, and then notice the next what did I know goes on to the last line. There's not a pause. What did I know, comma, what did I know of love's lonely and austere, excuse me, of love's austere and lonely offices? What's the sex of the speaker? I don't like the word, the word gender. What's the sex of the speaker? Male or female? Notice what your editor suggests in the paragraph that follows about six lines down. The person who reflects on those winter Sundays didn't know until much later how much he had to thank his father for love's lonely, for love's austere and lonely offices. 
But then two lines later suggests voice could be a woman's. So if the voice could be a woman's, why does Michael Meyer say he two lines above that? What's the purpose of the repetition? What did I know? What did I know? Emphasis. What's being emphasized? Back then, when Dad was getting up early, warming up the house, shining my shoes, I didn't know Jack, you know what, about love's austere and lonely offices. What are, what is meant by love's austere and lonely offices? Office there, by the way, does not mean like a, a cubicle, a room that you go to to work. It has the older meaning, duties, obligations, responsibilities. So what did I know of love's austere and lonely duties, responsibilities, obligations? What's the tense? Did. Why? Because the speaker does now. The speaker now understands why. Reading into it? Yeah, a little bit. Or we are interpreting it. Because the speaker is in those same shoes now. The speaker has become, essentially, the father. And the speaker's like, and my child or my children are exactly the same way I was. That's why it's this austere and lonely offices. What does austere mean? This room is kind of austere. What is this room like? <laughs> we could go on all day. What are some of the things this room lacks? Color, warmth. Color, warmth, humanity. You know, Peck Hall is not known for its building up the soul, so to speak. Okay? It's deadening. Okay? Love's lonely and austere and lonely offices. The speaker is suggesting love requires a person to do what? To put an emphasis on the other, even when there may not be any reciprocity. Notice the image, by the way, of the father is, we would say today, it's kind of stereotyped, right? I had a student in one of my classes, my first class, the other day, say, you know, it's, you know, it's following a, a gender stereotype of the father as provider, protector, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, yeah, because, you know, when's the poem published? 1962. When? Most fathers were providers, protectors. What's the father doing? You could say he's providing. He's warming up so that everybody else doesn't have to wake up to a cold house and all that kind of stuff. So read the little paragraph, what, you know, what it says. Notice we aren't ever told the sex of the speaker. It might be a woman. Especially if the woman... If the speaker was born, let's say, 1957, 1956, and is five or six years old, and now is looking back, and is now, or in 1990, or something like that, or let me, let me go back. Could be that the speaker in 1962 is a 20 year old, or a 30 year old, or 40 or 50 year old, and is comparing life now with what my father's life was like, okay? Things have changed a lot. Go on. Go to page 592. We're going to talk about this poem briefly. I'm going to change what, what I planned on doing, what I did for my first class, to what I'm going to do um, in yours, because my throat is, again, just getting worse and worse. Um, so we're going to talk about this poem, and then I'm going to refer to a bunch of page numbers, and we'll, we're going to get out early. 592. John Updike, Dog's Death. So, again, any poem 
that's not on the syllabus that we actually talk about and discuss in class may show up on a quiz or on the exam. Dog's death, I think, yeah, it is on the syllabus later. Yeah, because it is, I'm not going to talk about it today because my throat's really sore. So, uh, we're going to cover it the last day or two. So, turn to 596, okay? I'm not going to say much about it. Paraphrase. We talked about paraphrases, I believe, in talking about fiction, and everybody knows what a paraphrase is when you restate something in your own words. It's the same... Same thing for poetry. Um, trying to find my pages that are bent back. 603. Anagram and theme. Most of you know what an anagram is when you make up a word um, made from the letters of other words. Okay. Theme, it's the same thing as in fiction, again, in uh, drama, the main point, main idea of a poem. 604, <clears throat> lyric, short, brief poem that expresses the personal emotions, thoughts, attitudes, etc. Okay. Bottom of that page, uh, narrative poem and epic. You need to know what both of those are. An epic is a long narrative poem. It's, it's really the only difference between an epic and a narrative poem, okay? Generally, let me give a little bit more. It's about a major event, a major person, um, a founding narrative. The, probably the two greatest epics in history are Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. Next one would be Dante's Divine Comedy, three long poems that make up one a uh, whole Milton's Paradise Lost, which is about the fall of Adam and Eve and subsequent humanity and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Pages 606 and 607. <clears throat> You've got suggestions for approaching poetry. We've discussed some of these. Um, be useful to read. Keep going to... The next section, which is chapter 22, page 635 and following. Diction on page 635, all that is word choice. That's all diction means, okay? But 636 and 637, you've got examples of different kinds of diction, okay? Know what those are. Poetic diction, formal diction, middle diction, informal diction, okay? We use, in our normal everyday lives, hanging out with our friends and stuff, we use informal diction. We, we speak colloquially, right? When you're talking about poetry, most poetry, much poetry I should say, uses poetic diction, elevated language. You know, Hamlet's to be or not to be speech is very poetic. Not because it's written in poetry, but because it uses poetic diction. To be or not to be, that is the question. Really? What's, that po what's the point of that? Should I kill myself or not? That's the informal diction form of it. Formal diction is an even higher elevated form okay, of poetic diction. It's dignified, it's impersonal, it's elevated. You've got an example there from Robert Hardy's, um, excuse me, Thomas Hardy's Convergence of the Twain, okay? Middle diction is the language spoken by educated people. Educated here does not refer to like a high school education. It means a basic university or college education, all right? It's the kind of language, yeah, well, I shouldn't even say this anymore. It's the kind of language spoken, for example, by a TV news anchor on one of the major networks, I can't even say that anymore. What used to be the major networks, ABC, CBS, NBC. It's not the, the language spoken you know, on MSNBC, CNN, etc. 
because a lot of slang is thrown in there. Okay. Um, 637, dialect and jargon. Let's talk about jargon first because it's easier. Depending on what your major is, you're going to learn a lot of jargon. If you're in REM, Recording Industry Management, what's the jargon about? The kind of equipment you use. All right? The terminology for operating a soundboard. Okay? If you're in aerospace, terminology for flying an aircraft. All right? Uh, English, it, egghead, stupid, critical theory, and all that nonsense. All right? Dialect. It's kind of similar, but dialect is the form of language that you use that is largely determined by geography, okay? How does somebody from Hattiesburg, Mississippi speak compared to somebody from the Bronx, New York? Very different. It's not just accent, that's dialect, it's word choice. For example, I teach a history, I teach a course, I haven't taught in a few years, um, called the history of the English language, which is one of the things we talked about. How do you pronounce this? Do you say exit or do you say exit? See? A lot of people, depending on where they're from, will say exit. Egg, zit, or others will say exit. If you have bacon in the morning, the thing that you cook the bacon in, if you don't use a microwave, what do you call that pan? Is it a skillet or a frying pan? That's dialect, all right? Um, Denotations, connotations. I referred to these before. The word blue. Literal dictionary denotation. It's a color, right? Okay. A connotation, however. Sorry, not married. You're going to refer to that. No, I'm not. We're not going to talk about that poem today. Um, connotation, sadness, melancholy, things like that. So connotations are the associations the word brings forth. Um, and you got several examples there. 638, 639. Hold on, I wanna see if I have this poem on the syllabus. I don't. Very briefly, let's look at 638. Randall Gerald, Death of the Ball Turret Gunner. Remember, every time you look at a poem, every time you read a poem, pay attention to the title. The title gives you an idea of what it's about. So, the death, somebody dies, ball turret gunner. What's a ball turret gunner? Anybody know? What's a ball turret? Old bomber, or current bomber, B-52. I think B-52s have a ball turret, maybe not. B-25s, B-17, B-18s, World War II. So on the fuselage, that's the long tube of the plane, at the back of the plane, um, some of them on the top, some of them on the bottom, some of them had both, you would have a guy who would sit in the seat and that seat would rotate. The seat would have glass over it and would have a slot through it that the barrels, I think of a 50 caliber machine gun, would fire out of, okay? So if a bomber, if a, a squadron of planes was on a bombing run, you would have guys sitting in these so that when fighter planes came after them, they could try to shoot them down. They would rotate and turn around and stuff. You saw the same kind of thing in Star Wars with Luke and Han Solo in the Millennium Falcon and their ball turrets. So this is a gunner who sits in a ball turret and he dies. From my mother's sleep, I fell into the state and I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze. Six miles from earth, loose from its dream of life. I woke to black flack and the nightmare fighters. 
When I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose. The reason this poem was included is because of the term that comes up next, persona. When we talk about the speaker of a work of fiction, like The Minister's Black Veil, or any of the other short stories you read, um, Good Man is Hard to Find, we, we describe that speaker as a narrator. When we describe the speaker of a poem, we call the person or the speaker a persona or speaker. Speaker or persona, either of those is fine, okay? So notice I in the first line, I in the second line, I in the fourth line, I, I, I. That's the persona, all right? From my mother's sleep, I fell into the state and I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze. What's the state and what's the belly and what's the wet fur? Six miles from earth, loose from its dream of life, I woke to black flack and the nightmare fighters. That's a little bit easier to understand. When I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose. Well, dead people can't speak, so how can this person? Because it's a poem, it's not meant to be realistic, okay? From my mother's sleep, it's like from the moment of birth, boom. I suddenly found myself what? In the state, state capitalized, kind of implies the government took control of me, okay? Not literally, metaphorically. Why? What happened in World War II? Happened in Korea, happened in Vietnam. Did not happen for either of the Gulf Wars, for Afghanistan, etc. Even though you guys have to register for selective service, I don't think you women do yet, it's coming, Congress has talked about it. Um, why do you register for selective service when you turn 18? In case they need to draft you. Case, in case they need to draft you to go off and fight. <clears throat> Hasn't been a draft for, geez, over 40 years, over 45 years, all right? I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze. Okay, the belly is the plain. What's his wet fur? And why is it freezing? What do pilots and the crew of a bomber plane wear? Bomber jackets. Leather on the outside. Animal fur, real fur, not fake, on the inside. Why? Because six miles from Earth, 30,000 feet up, okay, bomber planes in World War II, something's going on with my eye. Bomber planes in World War II were not heated. You're up 30,000 feet. What's forming on the outside of the plane? Ice, frost. Inside of the plane, it's freezing. So you wear fur-lined bombers and if not fur, felt or flannel lined, you know, pants, etc. So why is his fur bomber jacket wet? Is being a ball turret gunner a non-stress environment? No, if you've got fighter planes coming after you, you're you know, sweating bullets, as the phrase is. So it's not just sweat here, it's sweat on the arms, the back. I mean, you're dripping sweat, and it's freezing. It's freezing in the turret, okay? So as soon as the sweat moves from your body to the fur of the coat, it freezes. So he's now encased in this. I woke to black flak, that's the anti-aircraft fire from down below. And the nightmare fighters. Those are the fighters coming after him. When I died, so there's the death. They did what? They washed me out of the turret with a hose. And I think that's implying not only the remains in the turret, but washing off the glass from the blood and whatever else was, you know, body parts that were scattered. Okay? Why'd they wash them out with the hose? I, I don't mean with a hose particularly. What's the, what's the purpose of cleaning the turret? So that a new crew member can take the place and go back up. 
Okay. Ambiguity, 639. Everybody knows what ambiguity is. It implies that there are, or it means there are two or more possible meanings. Several of you on, you know, quizzes, you'll put a response to an answer and I'll put too ambiguous. Be more exact, be more clear, be more precise kind of thing. On a quiz, you want to be as exact and clear as possible. In poetry, poets want to be ambiguous. Why? It allows for more possible interpretations. If you're delivering a speech, you don't want to be ambiguous. You don't want people to go, what's he mean? Okay, but with poems you do. Word order, syntax, that's all syntax is, word order. <clears throat> to be or not to be, that is the question. The question is whether or not to exist. Who famously in fiction, maybe film, uses a screwed up word order? Maybe that's Yoda. Yoda does, right? Yoda does not speak subject, verb, object. That's standard English. Subject, then the verb, then the object. Yoda usually puts the object first, then the subject, then the verb. A lot of languages are arranged that way. Okay, English is a subject, verb, object. There are other languages that are verb, subject, object, or object, verb, subject, kind of a thing. Tongue, we've talked about that with the other stuff. Author's attitude towards whatever it is that's being written. 645, carpe diem. I know I've got this somewhere later on the syllabus. I do actually have it for today, but I'm going to hold off. We'll probably um, do it later because my throat is going. Carpe diem, seize the day. That's what it means, okay? We'll discuss the poem on 645, To the Virgins to Make Much of Time, and the poem on 647, Marvell to his Queen Mistress, um, probably on Monday. So Carpe Diem, seize the day. What does that mean? Do everything you can today, while you can. Why? Because you might die today. You don't know that there's a tomorrow. There's a famous Roman phrase, pretty sure it comes from the Greeks. Eat, drink, and be merry. Anybody know how the rest goes? For tomorrow we die. Suck everything you can out of life today. Because you don't know that there is a tomorrow. It's essentially what the two poems by... Um, Herrick and Marvel were saying, okay? Um, go on. Images, 669. An image is exactly what it sounds like with this exception. In everyday language, when we hear the word image, what do you immediately assume is being described? Or what is meant? A sound? A texture? No, we think visual image. In poetry, an image can be anything that appeals to the senses. So it can be a smell, it can be a sight or something you see. It can be a taste. It can be a sound. So for example, look very briefly at, well, where is it? No, 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 no. I'm looking for a poem by in a later section, and I can't remember it. By Poe, called the Cataract. I'll come to it later. Um, on page 
You don't have to turn to this. Listen to, just listen to this. I'm going to read it three or four times. So much depends upon a red wheel barrow glazed with rain water beside the white chickens. That's how it's punctuated. Now let me just read it. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. Now, if I were to tell you to close your eyes and tell me what you see, you would see that image. And I bet throughout this day, you're going to have an image of a red wheelbarrow pop in your mind sitting next to white chickens, and it's going to be wet. What's the poem mean? Nothing. <laughs> well, probably nothing. What is the poem entirely about? That image. That's it. Except for, so much depends upon. What depends upon? A red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside white chickens fate of the world. I have no idea. Okay, But what William Carlos Williams is doing there is he's just giving you images. Okay? And I lost my place. Six. Sixty-nine. Um, turn to very briefly Figures of speech, 688 and following. <clears throat> Everybody knows what a figure of speech is. When you say something by means of another thing, or you, you mean something by saying something else, not literally the thing. What are the most common, yeah, probably, most common forms or the most common figures of speech? Do I have them written down? Right on. Similes and metaphors. What's a simile? How do you create a simile? Like, as, rather, than. You use some kind of comparative term, okay, where you are comparing Two things that are usually dissimilar. He eats like a pig, right? Humans are dissimilar to pigs. But by saying he eats like a pig, how do pigs eat? They just stick their snout down and, you know, go crazy. Somebody who eats like that, bad manners kind of a thing. What's the difference between he eats like a pig and he's a pig? Which one's more forceful? The simile or the metaphor? When you're saying something is something, that has a lot more force to it. Okay? Look at the little poem on 690. Margaret Atwood. And again, because I'm going to mention it and discuss it very briefly, it can show up on a quiz or exam. That applies to any poem that's covered in this section. Just look at the first two lines. You fit into me like a hook into an eye. Okay. More than likely, not being sexist, more than likely, the women in the class have a better understanding of that hook and eye than the men do. Why? Ashton, you're grinning. If you've ever worn a dress, you've probably had to fumble around with a hook and an eye. Or if you've worn a bra, it's got a hook and an eye somewhere on it, unless it's a sports bra. The hook is the thing that attaches to the little eye at the top of a zipper. What's the purpose of it? If you don't put the hook in the eye, the zipper might on its own come down, okay? You fit into me like a hook into or in, into an eye. In, in terms of clothing, that's an appropriate image. The one belongs in the other. And then you get the second stanza. 
a fish hook, an open eye. Kind of jarring. Why? Those two don't belong. I mean, think about that image, literally. Put it in your mind's eye. A fish hook in the eyeball. It's a very painful, disgusting image. So how well do you, the person being addressed, fit into me? Not alone, not at all. These two don't get along. This is a, a jarring image, all right? Notice, like a hook into an eye is a simile. A fish hook, an open eye metaphor. Okay? So, metaphor also makes comparison. It just doesn't use the comparative terms. Metaphors are therefore harder to understand. They're also harder to create. George Orwell wrote a, a uh, pamphlet about the use of language in politics called Politics and the English Language. If you've never read it, look it up on the internet. I highly, highly recommend it. If only our politicians would be required to follow what he says. But one of the things Orwell says in there, I, I use this when I teach freshman comp, is never use a metaphor you've seen before. In other words, create your own metaphors. One of the age-old, time-worn, overused metaphors politicians will use, especially heads of state, is we stand shoulder to shoulder with whoever. How is that a metaphor? Notice a metaphor is a comparison. Okay, Shoulder to shoulder. It's an image. How old is the image? Why did I say it's time worn? It's age old. It goes back to ancient Greece. I mean, like 500, 1000, 1500 BC, ancient Greece. It's the image of soldiers in a phalanx, okay? They would line up in rows, so you have a row here, row here, row here, and they would literally line up shoulder to shoulder, sword, spear. And if somebody was shooting arrows or throwing spears from over there, raise the shield, raise the shield and everybody's covered. And the guys in the front row hold their shields up, spears underneath, so you have a wall, and they would just march and mow down their opponents. That's the shoulder to shoulder image. That's where it comes from, okay? So 691, you have different kinds of metaphors. You have an implied metaphor, you know, the example given, he brayed his refusal to leave. Braid, donkey's braid, jackass's braid. It's implied he's, what's meant by braid then? This guy's really stubborn, okay? Because that's what donkeys are, all right? Extended metaphor refers, in the, the example given is the poem catch, on 596, you can go back and look at it, where the entire poem is about playing catch. But the thing that's being thrown back and forth are words, metaphors. It's, it's all about how poetry works, okay? A controlling metaphor is when the comparison goes all the way through the poem. The next page, introduces Anne Bradstreet in her poem, The Author, to her book, which we'll, we're going to talk about later, okay? The book is her book of poetry. It's full of individual poems. She refers to those poems as her brats, her children. Anne Bradstreet did have a lot of kids, okay? She didn't call her children brats. The controlling metaphor is that her Poems are like children. And it's, we'll talk about how that works when, when we get to it, all right? Pun, we know what puns are. We've talked about those with Shakespeare and such. Bottom of 693. 
694, synecdoche or synecdoche, as some people pronounce it, in metonymy, figures of speech, synecdoche, in which part of something is used to signify the whole. For example, Washington said today, it doesn't refer to the city of Washington, and it doesn't refer to George Washington, it refers to the government. Or the White House proclaimed means Biden, okay? Metonymy, in which something closely associated with the subject is associated, excuse me, is substituted for it. She preferred the silver screen to reading, that is, prefers watching movies to reading. Or she preferred the silver screen to the stage. An actress who prefers to act on film and not live. All right? Would be another example. Um, 697, 696. Several phrases there. Just be familiar with them. Understand the definitions. Uh, I'm just going to rattle off some page numbers because my throat is really bothering me. So... It's all figures of speech. Turn to 710. Symbol, irony, no, symbol, allegory, and irony. We know what symbols are. We've talked about symbols with both fiction and drama. Okay. Conventional literary, again, we talked about those. Allegory, we've discussed. Didactic poetry, uh, it's Exactly what it means. It's poetry that wants to teach something. Also very lightheaded. Um, religious message, moral method, uh, message, ethical message, political message. This is on 713. Didactic poetry. Or a didactic poem. Okay. Allegory and didactic poetry, it's usually kind of boring. Do you have the 10th edition or the 11th? It, pages uh, 717 is where we were. Okay. Um, why? Because it's preachy. It, I mean, it just, it really beats you over the head with the idea. Satire, okay, we talked about where you ridicule something, but it's not just ridicule. That is, Satire is not meant just to tear down. I'm on 718 now. It's not meant to just tear down. Satire is you ridicule something, you point out its folly, its idiocy, for the purpose of reforming it. It's not parody in that sense. Parody just makes fun of something. Okay? Satire, you want the person to change. Um... When Alec Baldwin does his Trump, I've never seen it, but I've seen clips and you know heard about it. I don't see it for Saturday Night Live anymore because it hasn't been funny in 20 years, in my opinion. Uh, well, actually, more like 30 years. Um, when Alec Baldwin does his Trump impersonation, what's the purpose? It's to destroy. It's to tear down. Okay, That's not satire. Satire would be to, as Shakespeare puts in Hamlet, to hold the mirror up to nature. For what purpose? To point out somebody's flaws to get that person to change. To get that person to say, oh man, I'm being an idiot. I should stop doing that. Okay? Dramatic irony, we've gone over a lot. Cosmic irony, you know, you've got there on that page. Um... Sounds, 737 to 753. Ballad, we're going to talk a little bit more when we talk about Scarborough Fair because we're going to read and discuss Scarborough Fair. And at the same time, I will bring in a recording of Simon and Garfunkel's version of Scarborough Fair, which is very similar, but they change a bit. Okay? 
Sounds on 734 and 735, be familiar with those terms. Some of them you probably already are. Um, 738, 739, the terms there talking about the kinds of rhyme. This was the poem I was looking for, but now I don't remember why I was looking for it. The mind is a terrible thing to lose. Um, in rhyme, it's exactly what it sounds like. Line of poetry rhymes at the end of each line. Internal rhyme, what it sounds like, where the line has rhyme within it. So look on 738, just line 30. Dividing, gliding, sliding. Iding, iding, iding. That's the internal rhyme. But look at line 30 with line 32. Sliding, striving. It's got the end ing rhyme, okay? It's called feminine rhyme there because you have the iding, striving, okay? Rhyme stress syllable followed by one or more, looking at 719. Rhyme unstressed syllables. Iding, id, rhyme, ing, unrhyme. And then i've, rhyme, unrhyme, right? Um, so be familiar with those terms and the examples kind of that are given. I think that's the last I did. Uh, for Monday, Monday we're going to pick up with, because I'm getting really loopy for some reason. Um, Monday we're going to pick up with Section 27 or chapter 27 on 754. And we're going to talk about some principles of meter, but I, I want to say this before I let you go. On 756 and 757, the terms you need to know are foot, and then the, the terms in bold print on 757. You don't need to know the names of the kinds of meter that are on 756. That is, I'm not gonna have a word or line of poetry and you're gonna have to tell me whether it's iambic or trochaic or an anapest or a dac, I'm not gonna do that, okay? You do need to know what a foot is, stress and unstressed syllables or unstressed and stressed syllables. And you need to know rising meter and falling meter and a line and those, those things, all right? And I think that is about actually what I did the other day in uh, my first class. So we will pick up actually on Monday on 776, talking about some kinds of poetic forms or genres. Uh, I did not put any down here. All right, have a good weekend. Don't forget, if you haven't done it, most of you haven't, uh, drama exam due Monday evening. I'll. Uh